my beautiful Origin Church family, good afternoon. I don't know about you guys, but when Orlando said, I'm living proof of what the mercy of God can do, I felt it. Just the very fact that he could stand here this morning and, and sing and celebrate God in the middle of what he's going through is a testimony. And this is what God calls us to. He calls us to glorify him in every circumstance. Every circumstance. Our message this morning, we are going to be doing part two of a message that is entitled Free at Last. Free at Last. We have been looking at the freedom that Jesus procures for us at the cross. And we've been doing so from the book of Galatians. We've been looking at Galatians. Last week we looked at chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Thank you, honey. And this morning we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 26. So Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 26. Please join me for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your presence here today. We believe that you're here because you promised us that you would be. You told us that if two or three of us come together, you will be here with us. And we trust that you are. We trust that you're receiving our praises, receiving our prayers. And we just want to thank you for that. And as we open up your word this morning, Father, we invite your spirit to cleanse us, cleanse our minds, cleanse our hearts, and help us to understand everything that we read this morning the way you want us to understand it. And we pray for these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 You know, there are um, many people in this world that have this idea that freedom is breaking away from the rule of God. They want to run away as far as possible from God. Um, back in the, during the pandemic, we were doing the Psalms every morning, and we came across the Psalm 2, Psalm number 2, where David really nails this point of view that the world has. And he describes it this way. He says that this is what the world says. They said, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. That's how a lot of people view God. A lot of, a lot of people view God like a probation officer who's trying to violate us and send us back to jail. The irony is that freedom is not found in running away from God. The irony is that the further we move away from God, the more enslaved we are becoming. We become enslaved to our compulsions, we become enslaved to our impulses, and we live just to satisfy our flesh. Last week, we discuss that moving away from God, when we move away from God, we look less and less like him. And if God is sovereign, and God is in control, and God has dominion, when we look less and less like him, then we look more like a subordinated being. We don't look like dominion, what we look like is slavery. You see, God discloses his laws and his ways to us, not to enslave us, but to set us free from the bondage that we created for ourselves. We separated ourselves from God through sin. And when we did that, we became less and less like him and we became more like a slave. So what God does is he reveals his ways to us because he sees us struggling. We mistreat each other because we no longer love each other naturally. Loving doesn't come naturally to us. If we had remained one with God, and still operating by his spirit, we wouldn't need to be told not to lie to each other. We wouldn't need to be told not to steal. We wouldn't need to be told not to betray each other because we would function and operate in the character of God, and none of these things are part of his character. And that behavior would come naturally to us. Apart from God, we give in to all of these hurtful behaviors, and we hurt one another. And then it is as a response, we try to fight for better treatment because we feel in our being that we don't deserve to be treated like that. Deep down inside, when someone lies to you, you know you're not supposed to be lied to. When someone steals something from you, you know that's not supposed to happen. So you're fighting and demanding to be treated different. But every one of us is powerless to love each other properly. We're powerless to treat each other the way that we deserve to be treated 
because we separated ourselves from the person who gave us the power to do that. God watches us and he sees us biting and devouring each other, so he tries to help and he reveals his commands to us. He reveals his ways to us, teaching us that if you love each other, the way that I operate is I don't you know, have to lie to people. I don't have to kill people. I don't have to steal from people. And he allows us to understand who he is and his character. And um, he allows us to understand who he is and his character. And so his laws and his ways are not to restrict us. They're not to put us in jail. His laws and his ways are actually for our benefit. Coming to understand that God's ways are for my protection and for my benefit changed my life. You guys know that story. I've probably told it to you like a thousand different times. But it's something that I keep telling people because it's something that really changed my perspective. I was, when I met my wife, I was a seeker. I was in the early stages of trying to find my way back to God. It's something that I kind of heard remotely growing up. My mother tried to instill God in me, but I went my own way. And when I hit rock bottom and my life had completely fallen apart, I started craving and wanting to get back into a relationship with God, but I was still in the early stages. I didn't have a deep relationship with him at all. I had just made a practice of, you know, I'm going to pray regularly, but my prayers were very shallow. They were very, you know, just I used to curse in my prayers. <laughs> you know, I had this kind of irreverent mindset. You know, what the, you know, and I just had this kind of a demeanor about prayer. But I was still on a seeking quest. I wanted to understand this whole spirituality thing. And um, I remember the very first day that I met my wife and I told her that. And I had told her all my business, all my dirty laundry and all the different stuff that I had done. And we were talking. And um, she mentioned having gone to church on a Saturday. And I said to her, well, who goes to church on a Saturday? People go to church on Sunday. Who the hell goes to church on you know, Saturday? She said, well, it's one of God's commands. And I says, oh, please, you know, commandments, commandments, you know. All this stuff is a bunch of rules to try to keep people locked up, and it's just a practical joke. That was my attitude. That was my perspective. I viewed God the way that David described these people wanting to run away from God because they think God is a probation officer trying to keep people locked up. That's how the world sees God. Maybe it comes from the way that the, 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 the church preaches it. Maybe it comes from the way people teach people about God. But that's the point of view that the world has, and I was one of them, so I could testify that that was the perspective. But in that conversation, when I mentioned that, I said, you know, this is a practical joke. And she said to me, she said, don't think of it as restrictions, but think of it as prescriptions for your life. And had you been living by those prescriptions, then all that stuff you just told me <laughs> would not have happened. Amen. And I had to say, touche. You know, she, she, she made a lot of sense. That was one of the most profound statements that I have ever heard in my entire life. She shifted my entire perspective, and that's why I married her. <laughs> she shifted my entire perspective about the commands of God. That was the moment where I started to understand. It's like it's, it, 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 it makes sense. God's ways are not to try to enslave us, but God's ways are in a way to, for our benefit and our protection. God doesn't get anything out of us keeping his laws. A lot of times we act like we're doing God a favor by keeping his laws. We act like God is some kind of a salesperson that's going to get a commission for every person that keeps his commandments. And we act like God is trying to persuade us because he's getting something out of the deal. God's not getting anything out of the deal when you refrain from stealing. What you're doing is you're benefiting your friend. You know, you're not stealing from your friend. You've loved your friend. Stealing from your friend is treating your friend poorly. Stealing from someone is treating them poorly. Lying to someone is treating them poorly. So when God gives us these commands, it's because he sees us killing each other. He sees us destroying each other, and he's trying to reveal a different way to us. He's trying to show us a better path. He's trying to show us a path that will allow me to love you better and for you to love me better. And he's revealing these ways for your benefit and mine. God doesn't get anything out of the deal by us keeping his ways. It's for your benefit. Without realizing it, I was a slave to my compulsions. I was a slave to my impulses and satisfying my flesh. My actions hurt a lot of people. And in the process, I hurt myself. 
There was a lot of lies. There was a lot of betrayal, a lot of adultery. I'm not even calling it adultery because I wasn't even married. It was more sexual immorality. You know, just living a lifestyle where I hurt a lot of people and I hurt myself a lot in the process. I had no framework on how to love people properly, nor did I have the power to do so. So I was just like most people when we're born into this world, we have no framework on how to love. When God reveals his commands to us, he's teaching us how to love, teaching us how to love one another. But we don't have the power to be able to love one another. And this is one of the things that the death of Jesus Christ procures for us. Jesus sets us free. And he allows the Holy Spirit of God to now be able to indwell us and give us the power to be able to live according to his ways and his character. By having God's spirit within us, we are freed from our compulsions. We're freed from our impulses. We actually can have a little bit of self-control by way of the Holy Spirit. You guys know how hard self-control is. You know how difficult it is to refrain from the donut. <laughs> But by reconciling us to God and, you know, Jesus makes it possible for God's spirit to dwell within us and he gives us the power to be able to love one another. That's amazing news, isn't it? Well, Paul thought so as well. The apostle Paul thought that it was such good news that he walked around spreading it. He walked around preaching to everybody, telling them how amazing this was. He walked around telling everybody how Jesus took us out of slavery and how he took us out of the slavery that we brought ourselves into. And he was walking around telling everybody how Jesus set us free. And the best part about it, one of the things that Paul was most excited about, was that in order to receive this freedom that Jesus secured for us, we didn't have to do anything to earn it. Paul was excited about the fact that we didn't have to do anything to earn the freedom that Jesus procured for us, nor could we earn the freedom that Jesus Christ procured for us. Our freedom is offered in Christ absolutely free without any contribution or effort from your part. He preached this and many people came to Christ. Many people believed it. Many people got excited about it. And I was telling you last week, sometimes when I get bummed out, I go back and I reflect to that early stage when I first got saved. And I remember the enthusiasm, how we were zealous. You know, I'm zealous and enthusiastic. And, you know, you're just so happy you're on clouds, right? But last week we explored how there's a lot of people you're going to encounter that who have not embraced that same freedom. And they're going to try to douse your flame and douse your fire. There's a lot of people that did not agree with Paul's teaching. They didn't agree with all this freedom talk that he was talking about. Oh, people can't just be saved just like that. People can't just be saved without keeping the laws of God. They need to keep the commands of God. Acts chapter 15, verse 1, it specifically says, Acts 15, 1 says, Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching to those believers, those new believers, unless you are circumcised according to the customs taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. So people would say that to you. If you don't observe the Sabbath, you, you, uh, if you eat this, if you put that on, if you walk this way, do that. And they got a big list of rules and the commands of God. And they were telling these new believers, I know you're excited about that whole Jesus thing. That's cool and all that, but you know, you got to do this, right? And last week we discovered that this is a satanic deception. And I'm going to say that very clearly, a satanic deception. Satan has always attempted to distort God's commands. Ever since day one in the Garden of Eden, he went to Eve. You know what he asked her? He says to her in Genesis 3, he says, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? That brother knew that there was only one prohibition, but he flipped it. And he made it sound restrictive. He made it sound like jail. He knew that God said to her, you could eat from any tree in the garden. God gives us more freedom than he does prohibitions. He gives us more freedom than he does prohibitions. You can eat from any tree in the garden. There's only one thing I don't want you to do. I don't want you to eat from the one tree. He flips it around and says, your God don't let you do nothing, huh? Your God don't let you have no fun. 
Did God really say that you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And you remember the story. She starts to explain, oh, well, no, 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 no. That's not what he said. He said that we could eat from all the trees but this one tree. And then, oh, no, no. He confused her and twisted it around. And he made God seem like God was trying to keep them trapped. He made God seem like God was trying to keep them in jail. That's what a lot of religious leaders do when it comes to the word of God. They take God's word where he's preaching freedom and he's trying to tell you that Jesus Christ died to set you free and they twist it around and they try to add all these different things to it to tell you all the stuff you've got to do to earn your freedom, to earn your salvation, to earn your love from God. They try to twist it around and they add that stuff in there. And Paul cautions us about the danger of mixing this little, he calls it yeast, in the whole batch of dough. In Galatians 5 verse 9, he states, a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. Once you start bringing that little bit of legalism into the gospel, it can corrupt the entire gospel. You have so many people that walk away from church because they don't understand that God wants them to be free. They don't understand that God loves them despite their failures and their mistakes. They don't understand that that's the very reason why Jesus Christ had to go through the sacrifices because you were incapable of doing it. They put burdens on people and want people to conduct themselves this way or that way to try to earn their salvation. And that is not the gospel. And like Paul said last week, that is no gospel at all. That is not good news if it's on me to save myself. Because I know that my willpower, my self-control is very limited. So if God was to leave me doomed to save myself, I'd be in trouble. And that's why Paul says that this is no gospel at all. It's not good news. So he realized the danger of even a little bit of this type of false teaching mixing into the gospel. So his entire epistle to the Galatians was dedicated to confronting this type of false teaching. He actually wrote an entire letter. It's like six paragraph, uh, six um, chapters, six whole chapters for us, but it's a long letter that he's writing to this church, trying to explain to this church, Jesus Christ wants you to be free. He doesn't want to put you in jail. He's not trying to get you to keep rules. Your, your rule keeping doesn't count for anything. You can't save yourself. You can't earn heaven. You can't earn God's love. Everything you do is filthy rags. Everything you do is broken, checkered. You need Jesus. That's what he was explaining to them. He came, he went through the process, he paid the price, his blood covers you, all you got to do is receive and accept him, and you'll be forgiven for all your sins. He wrote this to remind them that by having God's spirit within us, we're freed from the compulsions, the stuff that we have no control over, this sin that burdens us, that keeps us enslaved. Paul tried to explain to those Galatians that, listen, Jesus set us free from all that. And then we, he went on to explain to them that they were also freed from the rule keeping and trying to walk that tight rope. Last week we discovered, when we did part one, that we can be enslaved in two different directions. We can be just as enslaved by trying to keep the rules as we are in breaking the rules. We can be enslaved by our compulsions when we are trying to break the rules and live this crazy life. We are living by the flesh and we have no control, no self-control, and we give in to all of our impulses, that is living by the flesh, and that keeps us enslaved. That's one direction. But then there's the other direction. When we try to live by the law, and we live like, you know, the letter of the law, and we try to do things perfect because we're trying to prove to everybody around us that we deserve salvation, we're trying to prove to God that we're good boys and good girls, that keeps us enslaved just as much. So we can be a slave keeping the rules just as much as we can be by breaking the rules. And we put these things in categories last week. We said that living by the flesh is reactive and living by the law is proactive. When we're reactive, anything moves us. We're moving with the wind. Any shiny red object dis dis uh, distracts us. Any skirt that walks in, your eyes can't keep still. You gotta, gotta keep, you know, boom, boom, you know, keep looking. And we have zero control over our impulses. We're reactive. But then there's those that they take the law of God and they say, you know what? I'm going to be perfect like my father in heaven is perfect. 
And they tried to live perfect, 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 and these people are proactive. And we discovered last week that what God's looking for is not for us to be reactive or proactive. He's looking for us to be receptive. He wants us to receive his grace, receive his love, receive his son, receive forgiveness, receive the Holy Spirit. That's what God is asking for us to do. Not to be reactive or to be proactive, but he's asking for us to be receptive. Jesus has set us free from the slavery of sin as well as the burden of the law. And Paul reminds us that we're not only freed from this life that hurts people around us, but we're also freed from a life of trying to earn God's love. So in our key text in Galatians chapter 5, now we're picking up at verses 13 and 14. We're picking up at uh, verse 13. We're going to go to Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. Paul reminds us not to abuse that freedom, but to live our freedom loving God and loving people. Look what he says. Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. God's not trying to lock you up. He's not trying to put shackles on you. God's not trying to have you earn his favor. Plus, he gives you his Holy Spirit and gives you freedom over your compulsions and your impulses, and you're no longer a slave. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. However, he says, but don't use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, Love your neighbor as yourself. So Paul is describing here two different approaches. Sometimes people think that the freedom that Jesus Christ procured for us allows you to now go live a crazy lifestyle. Well, since God forgives me for everything, then I might as well go and live a crazy lifestyle, and I'm not going to get in trouble. I'll get away with it, right? But Paul is saying, see, when you do it that way, it kind of indicates you haven't really received the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God, what the Spirit of God is going to do is going to produce for you to now love one another. What the Spirit of God is trying to do is help you, empower you, give you strength to be able to act out the character of God that you have failed to, to act out through your sin. Because you became sinful, You lost the ability. You lost the connection with God. You no longer love naturally. So he revealed his ways to us, but we don't have the power to keep those ways. So now his Holy Spirit indwells us, and his Holy Spirit is trying to do one thing, trying to help us to live out the love that we're incapable of living out without his Spirit. So he says to us, love one another humbly. Serve one another humbly in love. And then he says, the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. You guys remember the commandments of God. There was a situation where these guys were asking Jesus, which one of them is more important? Is it the Sabbath, Jesus? You know, is it not killing? You know, killing, life is important. Jesus says, don't get hung up. Don't get hung up on each individual commandment where you're looking at a list and you're trying to walk a tightrope and you're walking around like a robot. Don't do it like that. The spirit of God's commandments is love. The reason you don't kill a person is because you look at them and you think this is a child of God. God loves them and I have to love them too. The reason you don't steal something from someone is because you realize that, you know what, they deserve to have this thing just like I do. The reason you don't break your vows and commit the adultery is because you realize the impact of what that adultery is going to do to the person you made the commitment to. The reason that we don't do these things, that list that God had given us is not for us to walk a tight rope and earn his favor. It's to teach us how to love one another. And these people were trying to figure out which one was more important. And Jesus says, stop sweating which one is more important. All of them together are embodied in one spirit, and that spirit is to love. And this is what the Holy Spirit empowers us to do. The Holy Spirit gives us the ability to be able to do that. So Paul is saying that With the Holy Spirit inside you, the Holy Spirit doesn't promote for you to now go live a crazy lifestyle. When you decide that since I'm forgiven, then I might as well go out and live crazy, then really it's an indication that you haven't really received the forgiveness of God. If you truly understood the pain, 
the sacrifice that Jesus went through for your sake, for your sin, you wouldn't trample on it like that. And so Paul is saying here, that's not the right spirit. That's not the right attitude to have based on this freedom. You're putting yourself back into slavery. You're just trying to satisfy your flesh. You're just trying to go back and indulge in these fleshly things. But he's recommending and he's saying here that we should love one another instead through the spirit. He says in verse 15, if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Now, this is very important. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Because of sin, we hurt one another. We do things that are painful to one another. We lie to each other. We still, we do all these different things to each other. And these things are hurtful to each other. And this is the reason we get into conflicts. This is the reason we get into fights. The conflicts that we get into is because we have a hunger for love. Deep down inside, we realize that we weren't designed to be treated that way. So when we get treated a certain way, we start demanding that we are treated better. We're demanding that we're treated well because people are treating us a way that we inside don't feel that we need to be treated. But people struggle with treating us properly because it doesn't come natural. But Paul says, listen, you guys are going to kill each other. You're going to keep hurting other people, and they're going to keep fighting for their rights. Do you think they're just going to take it? You think people are just going to lie down and take it when you lie to them, when you steal from them, when you kill a family member of theirs, when you do? You think people are going to take it? He says, if you keep going down this path and you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. You're going to fight for your rights. Everybody's going to fight for their rights. That's the reason we get into these conflicts is because deep down inside, you know, the type of treatment that somebody gives you, they're not supposed to treat you that way. And you're going to be fighting for your rights and everybody's doing it. But with the Spirit of God, God changes that because he allows us now to treat each other differently and treat us better. But verse 16 brings us into something that's very, very important. Paul wants us to know that even though he's suggesting for us to live by, the, by uh, to carry our way, ourselves according to the ways of God, we shouldn't try to do so by our own efforts. Trying to do it by our own efforts will not produce the result. He says that the only way for us to really be able to carry out the ways of God is by the Spirit of God. Amen. Verse 16, he tells us, he says, So I say to you, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Amen. Surrendering to the Spirit allows us to have victory over sin and over our compulsions to satisfy our flesh. And as a result, we start hurting each other less and less. So when you surrender to the spirit, you allow the spirit to govern. The spirit starts says, you know, you don't lie to this person. Don't steal this person's stuff. Don't kill this person. Don't betray this person. Don't covet this person. Don't envy. The, the spirit of God is convicting you every step of the way. And then you start becoming a person that as you're being transformed by the spirit. You start being, becoming a person that hurts people less. When you surrender to the spirit. It's important that we understand that this is a call to surrender, not to be proactive, but to surrender. You know, God doesn't leave you alone. He tells you that what you're doing is wrong. What he's asking you to do is listen to what he's saying. You know that you're not supposed to do this. You're not supposed to cross that line, but you do it anyway. What are you doing? You're resisting the spirit. You're not surrendering to the spirit. God's not asking us to take matters into our own hands, nor is he asking us to give in to our flesh. He's asking us to surrender to the Spirit of God. And in verse 17, Paul points out that when we try to do it on our own, we fail because the flesh is fighting with the Spirit of God. Look what he says in verse 17, Galatians 5, 17. He says, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. This is grace. Because the spirit of God fighting against your flesh, stopping you from giving into it 100%, that's grace of God. God is not allowing you to be all as bad as you could be. <laughs> not allowing you to give into it and be as evil as you could be. 
Romans 7, Paul describes the struggle that happens, you know, because even though the Spirit of God is trying to transform you, even though the Spirit of God is convicting you of different things, your flesh is going to resist. Your flesh is going to fight like crazy because your flesh wants to do something completely different. Your flesh is like a spoiled child throwing a temper tantrum in the middle of the store. I want what I want, and I'm not going down easy. Kicking, screaming, your flesh will continue to fight and resist the Spirit of God. Paul describes that struggle. The struggle is real. In, in Romans chapter 7, verses 14 to 20, he says this. We know that the law is spiritual. I know that the law of God is good. I get it, right? But me, I'm unspiritual. I was sold as a slave to sin. My parents, Adam and Eve, they sold me out. They wanted power. They wanted to be like God. They, wanted, they put the whole humanity in this jam where we've been sold to sin. Now we are slaves of sin. So in verse 15, Paul says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do, I do. You guys know that struggle? How many times do you went on a diet? What I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do, I do. Now he says in 16, and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. I mean, I get it. I know the stuff that God is telling me is good for me. I know that I'm not supposed to cheat on my wife because if I do, I get it. You know, we're going to end up in divorce court. I know. I know I'm not supposed to steal at work. I know. I, get, I know that the law is good and it's perfect and it's good for me, right? I agree that the law is good. As it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is the sin living within me. There's that slavery. You know that this is good to do and that is bad to do, but the sin that lives within you, the sin that you were born with, makes you not able to resist. So your flesh is fighting back and your flesh is saying, I want it my way. That's what your flesh is saying. Verse 18, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that it is my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I do not carry it out. I want to go to the gym. I do. But I don't carry it out. For I do not know for I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil that I do not want to do. This is what I keep doing. It's the stuff that I know I'm not supposed to do. That's the stuff that I keep doing. Verse 20. Now if I do what, do, now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living within me that does it. Paul is struggling here. He's showing us that the struggle is real. He's showing us that there's a battle going on. There's a fight happening. There's something taking place. There is years of programming of me being a sinful person, of me getting used to my bad habits and me doing things a certain way, me going through life, just basically giving in to my impulses. I see this. I want to do this. I do I'm doing all this stuff, all these distracted eyes, right? And the Holy Spirit comes along and says, you know, that's wrong. And my flesh is saying, why, 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 why are you bugging me? You've seen it like in the cartoons, how they draw it, right? They got the little angel on one side and the little devil. That's just a way of trying to illustrate this struggle. Your flesh is like, I want, listen, don't listen, don't listen to that. Just, just go. But the spirit of God is fighting and there's a war going on inside you between your flesh between your flesh and the spirit of God. So this is what Paul is saying. He's saying, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit desires what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. Two different gangs, okay, inside you. So you are not to do whatever you want. Grace, keeping you in check. You know how evil the world would be if we all just gave in to our impulses? When somebody pissed you off, you know what you would do? What would you do, Doc? <laughs> but then verse 18, he says, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Galatians 5, verse 18, picking back up to our passage. If you are led by the Spirit of God, you're not under the law. Living by love is not the same as living by the rules. Okay? Living by love is not the same as living by the rules. 
I heard a statement once that said, you know, rules without relationship leads to rebellion. So what this means is that you can choose how you want to live when it comes to your Christian life. You heard this gospel. God saves you. God wants a relationship with you. And you know what? Jesus says, just come as you are. You come. But then you decide, you know what? I'm either going to live by the law and keep everything like a tightrope and I'm going to walk like a robot and I'm going to do everything to the letter. I'm going to do it that way. Or I'm going to live by the spirit of God. Okay? Living by the law is burdensome. Living by the law is discouraging because you keep failing. He's saying here, living by love is not the same as living by rules. If I refrain from cheating on my wife because of the rules, after a while, it's only a matter of time till that gets burdensome and annoying. Well, I guess I'm not supposed to cheat on her. I guess I'm not supposed to go over here to this hotel. See, that's going to get burdensome. But living by love is completely different. When you know the impact of what that will do to her heart, when you know the impact of what that will do to her being, the betrayal, the lies, when you know the impact, when you're living by love and you're thinking about that person and loving them, that's a whole different motivation. But if you're living by the rules, it's only a matter of time until you give up. Rules without relationship leads to rebellion. That's why a lot of times when we try to raise our kids and it's just nothing but rules and we sketch out a bunch of rules, it's only a matter of time until when they could, when, soon as they could drive, soon as they, soon as they could drive, forget it. There's a rebellion that starts way earlier than that, but the point is that rules without relationship leads to rebellion. So let's talk about curfew, right? So what's the spirit of curfew? The spirit of it is I want to teach you to get home at a responsible hour. I don't want you to be this kind of person that is, you know, out in the street late at night. There's also stuff going on out there late at night. I already know what kind of stuff is going on out there. I'm trying to get you to understand discipline. I'm trying to get you to be responsible. So there's a spirit of what you're trying to instill. But if you just make the rule, I need you here, and I'm the boss, and I'm, I'm in command, I'm Hitler, right? It's only a matter of time till they break away from that. We have to find ways to teach the spirit of laws and not just give a bunch of laws and expect people just to follow rules and laws. Because any human being who is made in the likeness of God wants dominion. Every one of us here wants the dominion that's vested inside of us. You want things your way. In the likeness of God, you want to be able to speak and things, and it was so. You want your will to be done here in your environment as it is in your mind. That's what you want. You see how God wants his will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven? We want our will to be done in our environment as it is in our minds and our hearts. In the likeness of God, you want dominion. You want to do things your way. So as soon as somebody comes in with their rules and regulations, you will rebel. That's part of our nature. You see? Because we want dominion. We're just going about it the wrong way. But rules and regulations is not how God intended for us to live. The only reason he's giving them to us is because we've lost the ability to do things naturally, to love naturally. So Paul is saying that the spirit of God's law is love. And what Jesus did for us is he restored our ability to live by God's spirit, and he sets us free from the burden of trying to walk a tightrope. So through a relationship, we're not going to be rebellious because our motivations will be different. Amen. It'll be this Holy Spirit guiding and ordering our steps and allowing us to keep the commands of God, the Holy Spirit giving us the strength, giving us the power, giving us the victory on how to love each other properly. The Holy Spirit will be doing that. It's not going to be a person that is living like trying to walk a tightrope, and after a while you get frustrated. That's why a lot of people leave church. A lot of people leave church because church is set up in a way where it's so rule-based and it's so structured and legal and you can't do nothing without getting condemned and judged. 
Who wants to be around that? It's only a matter of time before people leave. Rules without relationship leads to rebellion. So the other way to do it is to live by the relationship. The relationship with God, the true love of God, the true love for God, and the true spirit of God working within us allows us to be able to naturally now do these things, but it's not because we're following a bunch of guidelines. The Bible teaches us, so, so, so now, how do we know? So we, we get this idea, right? We get it. We understand that, okay, you got a choice that you could live by the flesh or you could live by the spirit. How do we know if a person has embraced their freedom in Christ and they are, in fact, surrendering to the spirit? How do we know? How do we know if a person has embraced the spirit of God and they are surrendering to the spirit of God? The Bible teaches us to test the spirits. Test the spirits, right? However, however, we have a tendency to over-spiritualize it. You know, we over-spiritualize this idea. Oh, we have to test the spirits. Ooh. And it sounds very mysterious, right? Jesus made it very simple for us. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus made it very simple on how you test the spirits. Very simple. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 to 20. Look at what Jesus says. Jesus says, watch out for false prophets... They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. So he was talking to his disciples. He says, you know what? There's going to be people that are going to come, out, come around you that's not really real. There's going to be people that are going to infiltrate the church that's not going to be really real. Okay? And he says this in verse 16. You know how you test their spirits? He says, look at this. By their fruit, you will recognize them. He says, do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? If you want an apple, are you going to go to an orange tree? Likewise, every good tree, a good tree bears good fruit. And every bad tree bears bad fruit. Listen to 18. A good tree, a person with the Holy Spirit in them, cannot bear bad fruit. And a bad tree, a person without the Holy Spirit in them, cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, going to hell. Thus, verse 20, you want to know how to test the spirits? Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. That's what Jesus says. It's not mysterious. It's not, ooh, it's not like a big, you know, mis mysterious thing. You want to talk about testing the spirits? Jesus says very easy. Look, it's very easy to test the spirits. If... The kind of tree that it is, that's the kind of fruit that it's going to produce. If it produces this kind of fruit, that's the kind of tree that it is. Is that complicated? You got to look and examine what the fruit is of a tree. So now in verses 19 to 21, Paul now describes how it looks when a person is not surrendering to the spirit. Look what he says in verses 19 to 21. We want to know how you know. Well, this is how you know. Verse 19, Galatians 5, verse 19. He says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. The acts of the flesh are obvious. It's not hard to tell when a person is living by the flesh. It's not complicated. He's coming here, he's explaining. You want to know if a person is living by the spirit or if they're living by the flesh? Let me show you. He says, the acts of the flesh are very obvious. Sexual immorality impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. He says, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. God's not having it. All that stuff is not in line with his character. God is not about selfishness. You could see through the, 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 the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He's not selfish. God ain't got to be jealous of nobody because he owns all things. He's not jealous of nobody. Nobody threatens him. That's not of God. If you see those kinds of things, God doesn't worship anybody. Okay? There's no idolatry. God doesn't need witchcraft because God says, listen, he says it and it happens. He does what he does. 
God's not about hatred. God's not about, you know, fits of rage. If God was to have a fit of rage, trust me. Trust me, there would be nobody left here. Factions and little cliques and separation and division. God's not about getting drunk. He doesn't need to get drunk. He doesn't need to get buzzed. God's not about none of this stuff. So if you see this stuff, what Paul is saying, that it's obvious to know if a person's living by the flesh. See, if you give, if you let your flesh have their way, if you let your body have its way, and you just say, you know what, I'm just going to give in to who I, I just want to be me and just do me. Here's what you're going to end up with. You're going to end up with sexual immorality. Been there, done that. Check. You're going to end up with impurity and debauchery. Out drinking, you know, a you know, little buzz. Me and my friends, you know, the lifestyle that I live, you guys know that I was on a road downhill. You know, how do you, you, you make a plan? It's a plan. It's part of the culture. It's part of our whole mindset. We're going to go out tonight, and we're all trying to bring somebody home. Like, isn't it's, but it's common. And I'm looking back now at how I used to live, and I'm thinking to myself, what kind of ridiculous stuff is that? Literally going out. And it was so common. It was so normal. It was not a big deal. It's like, what kind of, you know, pick up a cutie. How many, you, you know, if it wasn't tonight, sometime this week. This is a normal life. You didn't have to wonder whether or not I was living by the spirit <laughs> or if I was living by the flesh. It was by the flesh. Selfish ambitions. My motivations for trying to make money and get rich had nothing to do with providing for a family. It had to do with driving a fly Maserati, pull up in front of valet and red carpet. That's what it, that's what it had to do with, the selfish motivations, selfish ambitions. It had nothing to do with providing for a family. So Paul is describing that he says, if you give in to your bodies, this is the kind of way that it looks. If you live by the flesh, it's obvious. You want to know if somebody's living by the flesh? Well, it's very obvious. If you see this pattern of behavior, then I can promise you they're living by the flesh. I love the way that the message, the message translation, I don't know if you could put that up there, Gary, but the message translation, right? The message reads like this. It's obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Remember what I told you? We, have, we want dominion. I just want things my way. I want this person. I want this money. I want this. I want it my way. It's obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex. A stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. Frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness. Trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied wants, a brutal temper, an impotence to love or to be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, Uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community, I could go on. This is how the message rewords it and puts it, and I think it's dead on. This is the kind of lifestyle that is produced when a person is living by the flesh. Might I add you, add, mind you that I'm going to add that even when a person is trying to live by the law, even when a person is trying to live by the law, they may be doing so on the outside, but there's a lot of this stuff going on on the inside. <laughs> the sexual immorality is going on in your head. You got, you got a lot of fantasies from the secret videos. See? So when you're living by the flesh, you could be trying to keep the rules, but sometimes it's wrongly motivated because you're not surrendering to the spirit. You're actually trying to do it yourself, but it's so hard. It's impossible. You can't carry the laws, laws of God, so you rebel, but you don't want to rebel in your community because you'll get judged and condemned because the church will condemn you, right? So guess what you do? You pretend. So you live by the laws according to the outside, but on the inside... You're having a fit of rage. I hate this brother or sister. 
There's an unforgiveness and a darkness that's going on inside. Emotional garbage. The cheap sex is going on inside. The magic show religion. When he talks about magic show religion, you're just performing at church. You know, Jesus. Living by the flesh, if this stuff exists in your outside or your inside, you know you're not living by the spirit. In contrast, in contrast, Paul now describes the way it looks when you're living by the Spirit. In contrast, verses 22, Galatians 5, 22 to 26. In contrast, Paul tells us this. When you surrender to the Spirit of God, you end up loving people naturally. You end up living out the commandments naturally, and you're not even thinking about it. You're not following rules and guidelines. That's not how you're living. God is producing something in you naturally, right? In verse 22, he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So when you're living by the Spirit, God allows you to be above the law. When I say above the law, there's no metric. There's no way of calculating how nice you can be to someone. There's no metric about how patient you could be. There's no way of quantifying how much joy you can have in your heart. There's no law. <laughs> There's no metric. There's no, you could be this joyful today. How are you going to measure that? The stuff that the Spirit of God produces, there's no law. It can't be contained by law. No one can tell you how many times you can forgive a person. No one can tell you how much peace you can have in your heart. There's no metric or guideline or any way of measuring how much peace and joy you have in your heart. He says, verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, or envying each other. So Paul is describing what the Holy Spirit produces in you. We, have a, we talk a lot about depression. Right? There's a lot of that going on. My wife was praying about that earlier today. We're praying about how this is common. We're hearing it in young people. We're hearing it in people all over the place. I, I'm going to tell you right now, that is not of the Spirit of God. I'm not denying that it's taking place. I'm not denying that you're feeling the way you're feeling. But it's important for us to recognize, recognize that there's a trick being played on us. I don't know how he got in there. I don't know how he did it. Maybe it was movies that I watched. Maybe it was music I listened to. Because he's slick. You know, remember Magic Show? Remember the witchcraft? Witchcraft? We talk about witchcraft, right? He said, you know, witchcraft, he said, when you talk about the works of the flesh, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft. Witchcraft is real. It's really going on. Certain songs you are listening to actually have chords and music in them that is tinkering with your insides. You guys know that music makes you emotional. Music can make you excited or angry or music does stuff to you. So there's melodies that are doing something inside of you that make you sad. Certain movies, I tell my sister all the time, I'm always telling my sister this, she loves those, you know, like, uh, what do you call those shows, the, um, uh, you know, horror, and, uh, you know, they're like, oh, those kind of horror shows, like the kind of, man, you know, don't, don't go there because the imagery, the imagery, the signs that are being flashed into your psyche, the stuff that you're putting in your eyes, you're seeing it, it's affecting you on the inside. You have to guard. You have to guard everything that goes in here because, see, you let him in. Somehow he got in. It could have been through something that wasn't your fault. It wasn't a decision you made. It could have been some childhood trauma, something that a person did. Last week we had an event on trauma and abuse. There's perverted people that Satan already messed them up, right? And so now guess what? They start messing up a little kid. Whether through abuse, sexual abuse, all kinds of things that mess up that kid. So the kid now has something inside them that is damaged them, right? But that damage, when well, you grow up now and you're experiencing depression, what I want you to know is that that is not God. See, God did not do that. Somebody who was not surrendered to the Spirit of God, somebody who was living sexual immorality, debauchery, somebody who was doing that did it to you. 
Somebody who was doing that abused you. Somebody who was doing that lied to you, betrayed you. Now you become a person who's very guarded and you don't trust and you don't trust. You know, how can I trust fathers? If you're telling me that God's my father, look what my father did to me. That's because your father wasn't surrendered to the Holy Spirit, so your father hurt you. That's not what God would have wanted your father to do to you. God would have given you your father to protect you. God would have given you your father for your father to love you and provide for you and to guide you and to teach you. That's what God would have wanted your father to do. But your father, who's not living by the Spirit, did something to hurt you. Now you're feeling the impact and you're living this life where you're miserable over something somebody else did to you. I just want you to understand that it is not of God. It's not of God. It is of somebody else. You see? If you have the Spirit, if you allow the Spirit, if you receive, like I said, it's not reactive or proactive, but if you receive the Spirit of God and you allow the Spirit of God to reign inside of you, you're not going to walk around depressed all the time. If you find that you're depressed, it's because you're not surrendering to what the Holy Spirit wants to do. There's that war going on and your flesh is fighting the Holy Spirit. I just want to be mad and I want to be mad and I want to be angry. And you're giving into the flesh. What God is saying is, okay, you hear the voice inside you saying, forgive them for they know not what they do. You hear that voice in your heart. You hear the voice telling you, your father didn't know what he was doing. Your mother didn't know what she was doing. That ex-husband didn't know what they were doing. Forgive them. Let it roll. You hear it in your heart. You hear it. God is trying to tell you. He's trying to tell you. You know, you, you know, don't worry about it. The Holy Spirit is talking to you, but you're resisting it and you're let, giving in to the flesh, and therefore you experience a lack of peace, a lack of patience. You experience, you know, just anger, frustration, all the opposite of these things that the Spirit is trying to produce. Love, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If you find yourself not having any control over yourself where you just can't help but do certain things, that is not of God. Because the Spirit of God will give you the power to resist and to overcome. That's the whole point. Jesus gives you victory and, and power over sin. So if you find yourself basically not being able to resist and you don't have any self-control, understand that that's not of God because the Spirit of God does give you self-control. The Spirit of God does empower you and give you self-control. One of the things, I want to close here with this, one of the things that God does, he promises us, and I, I'm not going to rapid fire verses at you because I got so many verses here that, are, that speak to this, right? I, I might throw them out there and you know, maybe, maybe you can take notes, but I won't read them. The theme of all these verses, you know, Isaiah 118, Jeremiah 31, 33, Jeremiah 32, 39, Ezekiel 11, 19, Ezekiel 36, Deuteronomy 10, Romans 8, 28. One of the themes, there's a theme in all these verses that I just kind of threw a bunch of verses out there, but there's a theme in these verses. And that theme is that God promises us that he's not going to leave us the same. He promises. He says, if you come to me, I want you to just come to me. Just, just come to me. You come hang out with me. Just come with me. I promise you. I'm not going to leave you the same. I know that you're broken. I know that because it's not even your fault. I know what happened when you were a kid. I know your inclinations. You know, I know what your tendencies are. I know you have a tendency to steal. I get it. I know you have a tendency to lie. Trust me. I know. I know exactly where it comes from. I know exactly what part of your genetic makeup causes you to do that. God is saying to us, I know all that stuff. I just want you to just come to me. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to, I'm going to transform you. All these verses, maybe I should read them, you know. Maybe I should read them. I'm just going to read them for you real quick. Just a couple of them. Isaiah 118. He says, come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. 
Jeremiah 31, 33. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Jeremiah 32, 39. I will give the singleness of heart and action. So the stuff that you want to do in your heart, you'll be able to carry it out so that they will always fear me so that so that and that all will then go well for them and for their children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I will never stop doing good to them. I will inspire them to fear me so that they will never turn away from me. I will do that for you. You don't have to worry about trying to stay with me and not run away from me. If you just surrender to my spirit, I will make you not want to run away from me. I'm going to give you the desire to want to be at church. I'll give you the desire to want to come be here. You don't got to make the effort to just show up for the pastor. Ezekiel 11, 19. I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. I will do that. I'm going to transform them. Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put my spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move and and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. You don't have to try. I will do that for you, says God, says the Lord. You don't got to make a bunch of effort to keep the rules. I'm going to do that for you. Deuteronomy 10, 16. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be a stiff neck any longer. But here's the one I love. Here's the one I really love. This is the one that everybody quotes, but this is the part of it that I love, right? This is the part. Man, this is the one right here. I love this one. Romans 8, 28. 8, 28 to 30. Everybody knows that one because we quote it a lot. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those who he called, he also justified. Those who he justified, he also glorified. Let me tell you the part that I really love in this verse right here, right? Just by giving us freedom of choice, okay? Just that alone then God creates the possibility for two different people in this world. Some that love him and some that won't. It's very simple. You're either going to be a person that loves him. Not everybody's going to hate him, right? Some people are going to love him and want to be with him in eternity. And then you're going to have another group because they have the choice to that are not going to love him. There's only two people in the world, two groups of people. Those that love God and those who don't. It's not complicated. It's only two groups of people. Two groups of people, right? Now, so it says here, for those who he foreknew, look, he says, so let me go back. He says, and and, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. So God says, okay, for the group that loves me, I got plans for them. For the group that wants to be with me, I got a plan for them. I got a destiny for them. Verse 29, he says, for those God foreknew, Because God knows all things. He knows there's going to be a group that loves him and a group that doesn't. And he knows exactly who they are. So God knows. If you're faking, if you're here faking, God knows. But if you're sincere, God also knows. We could be a group of 5,000 people. God knows exactly. I got 1,634 people that love me. The rest I already know. God knows. So he says, for those that God foreknew... Look what he did for those who he foreknew. Those who he knew would love him, this is what he did. He predestined them to be conformed to the image of his son. He says, I'm going to transform you and make you Christ-like. That's the part I love right there. I'm not going to leave you looking like an animal like you've been looking through your sin. Jesus is perfect. Jesus is glorious. Jesus is magnificent. And God says, I'm going to conform you to the likeness of my son. I'm going to make you like him. You see how amazing he is? Those that love me are predestined to be transformed, to be conformed to the image of God's son. 
those that love him. Glory to God. That's the promise of God. God promised you that he's not going to leave you like the animal that we become when we separate from him. We separate from him, we lost all of our capacity. We lost all of our power. We lost all of our authority. We have no dominion on this earth. You see how hard it's taken us? The stuff that we're figuring out right now that we're doing, the technology that we're fascinated with in 2023, do you understand that we are discovering stuff that God designed gazillions, he designed thousands of years ago? Stuff that he just spoke. And we're chopping it up, taking it apart. We're analyzing it, studying it. Aha! We discovered something. And we get so happy from our little discoveries. And we feel in ourselves because we invented airplanes. The bird just flies. Glory to God. I remember the story that I like. I like to share this story a lot with um, Peter cut off this guy's ear. Jesus picked it up and he just put it back on. <laughs> That's it. Epi, that's it. <laughs> that's it. For us, what would we do if you know somebody's ear got cut off right now? What would we do? Gotta go get some ice. Go get some ice. Call, call 911. We got to do all this stuff. We got there's a bunch of machines and a bunch of drama, right? See, we got no power. We just struggling. We trying to figure it out. We trying to figure it out. God says things and they happen. We're talking about a planets appearing, suns, moons, you know, earth just developing, you know, let there be. I just want this to happen. Every element, every atom, everything that is around knows what to do and how to do it when they hear the voice of God. Glory to God. And we have to realize that he's not asking anything from us. We separated from him and we started going in the wrong direction. We become less and less like him. So we become weak and subordinated and we become a bunch of slaves. And he's saying, I want to restore your dominion. I want to restore your power. And he's saying, I don't need you to do anything. I don't need you to bring nothing to the party. I will do it. That's what he says. Just come and I will do it. When it comes to our salvation, God is not looking for us to be reactive or proactive. He's looking for us to be receptive, receive his grace, receive his power. Amen. Jesus Christ died to save every single one of us and he makes us free. We have freedom in Christ. He slaves us, he, he, he makes us free from the slavery of our sin. He makes us free from trying to earn favor and love from God. We don't have to perform for God. He makes us free from the fear of death. You got a lot of people that are just terrified of dying. We're free from that. We don't got to be afraid of that. He makes us free from the need to conform to the ways of the world. The world has all these guidelines. If you're this age and you're not married, you need that. That's a law. That's an unspoken law. There's a rule that if you don't own this kind of a property at this age, if you haven't done this or accomplished that, those are laws. We're freed from having to conform to those laws. Jesus sets us free from having to find our value in the human validation systems that we develop. He sets you free. He sets you free from trying to validate yourself. Every single one of us have this freedom in Christ. And um, I just want you to understand that we're free. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty. We are free at last. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for the freedom that you vested us with in Christ. We don't take it for granted, Father. We don't take for granted the freedom that you've given us. We're not going to trample on it. But we know that surrendering to you is not easy. It's hard for us to surrender, to give in to your spirit, to let you reign in our lives. Give us the courage, Father. Give us the strength to be able to just let you do it let you do it. And we just want to thank you for such a beautiful and gracious gift. And we thank you for all you do in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Oh, man. Glory to God. Hmm. Glory to God. All right. 
So just a couple of announcements for you guys. Um, uh, the first announcement is that next week, next week, right, Dr. Dr. Um, Jasmine? Next week we have the, not next week, I'm sorry, the date, give me the dates, the 15th of April, which is not next week, but the following, right? The 15th of April, we're gonna have an event here um, on suicide prevention. Even though we preach this about the Holy Spirit, you know, working within us, we know how challenging it is for the people that are already enslaved. And there's a lot of people that are on the brink of desperation, a lot of people that are this close to suicide, and they're not saying anything about it. So we care about these areas of people's lives, and we have educational events, we have resources that we try to pull together to help people. And so we're having an event on suicide prevention on the 15th of April at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Um, the other thing is that last week we had an invited speaker that came in, um, or the week before, and he's putting together a parenting program. So if there are any parents that want to participate in that program, maybe you can use a little help, a little guidance with tools to help you with uh, parenting. We have a sign-up sheet, and I would ask after service if you would just sign up with, my wife will be over here with one sheet, and then Dr. Jasmine will be at the front desk. We only broke it up so that you don't have to wait in line. But if you're a parent and you want to participate in the uh, parenting workshop or parenting program and curriculum that's going to be going on, just sign up with Dr. Jasmine and my wife. And then there's one more event, which is our health fair that is coming up. We have a health fair that's coming up on the 15th of July. That event um, is going to be at 3 p.m. here. We have a lot of vendors. What's that? There is, as, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to come back to that one. I'm gonna come back to that one because that's for the health fair, right? Okay, before I do that, I don't wanna forget my singles ministry. The singles ministry, um, Merva has asked me for a few moments to speak about um, the event that's coming up, the retreat that's coming up. You wanna come up? Do you have a mic? Let's get a mic for Merv. I want you to come up and speak a little bit about the singles ministry coming up. We don't have a lot of people in church today, so I'm counting on who's here to tell others. We have singles ministry Bible study on Thursday nights, and um, we want to do something different coming up in June. We're going on a retreat. It's in Bradenton. It's going to be fun. I have already gone, the pastor, myself, and Siggy, to see where we're staying. The sign-up sheet is already, even though it wasn't announced from here, we just have a few spaces leave. And I'm encouraging all the singles to go. We're having a bus, and um, we were thinking of driving, but we want to be together when we're going. So I want you to sign up. I want you to come because that's where we're going to um, have a real bond. We talk about every Thursday how we can make ourselves better at being single. And our goal is to make ourselves stronger men and women um, in our singleness. Prepare for those who want to someday get married. Because most, um, some of us, I think all of us in singles ministry have been either married or in relationship before, and um, obviously failed relationship. And this is to really help us to be better in when you go in another relationship, not to take all the baggages that you had before. So we're going there to really bond. We're gonna have good speakers, we're gonna have fun, and it's not a camp like um, some of you have been to Camp Kalakwa with bunk beds and all that. It's hotel style. The place is really nice. And I'm looking forward to this time for us to really bond together away from church, away from just coming and saying hi and bye. So it's going to be July, not July, June 9th to 11th. So we're leaving on the Friday. We're coming back on the Sunday. The 
um, the cost for this for the whole weekend, including food and transportation, is $350. Now, most of you who have stayed places know there's no way you can go now and pay $250 for a whole weekend and be fed at the same time. So $350 is a good price. Um, some of us struggle. We might not have the whole 350 at one time, but we can put it in an envelope, whatever you have. Between now and June 9th to 11th, you put a little and you drop it in there, put singles ministry retreat. By the time June comes around, you're finished paying for your trip. So I'm looking forward to you guys um, who want to come to go and have such fun and to enrich our lives. The second thing I want to um, talk about, you know, Miris from Singles Ministry, Miris started what we call the blessing bag. And some of us have been doing it. And I want to encourage all of us, this is not just for singles, to always have in your car a little bag. We were supposed to call, get those bags printed up, but Jackie did something. She couldn't wait on the bag, so she went away. She got some little bags. And um, there's one thing that Mary says, a bottle of water and whatever little thing. And I tell you, it started with her doing just for the people on the corner. But we have found that just going around, going to work or wherever, there, there's always somebody that needs, you know, that, that, that little gift, something to let them know that they're loved, or they're thought of. So the blessing bags have extended to not just the people on the corner, but there are people around who just need that. So for those who don't want to do the blessing bags, Jackie has taught me, you can buy the stuff, you know, just buy the stuff and you know somebody else that is doing it. Just say, here, this is for the blessing bag. A few people have done that. So I want to encourage you guys to... Um, participate in the blessing bags and you'll find that you're being blessed from just handing out those little blessing bags all right. have a good day carl yes ma'am all right thank you all right so we covered um those two key events that are coming up the um suicide prevention event but the pastor feels so passionate about the health fair he's so excited about the health fair that even though he couldn't be here today he recorded a video so I'm going to move this, and Gary, I will let you take the floor. You guys have a happy Sabbath after watching this video. Good afternoon, Origin Church. I know that I'm away today, but I just wanted to give you guys an amazing announcement that we're having. You know, Origin Church, we've always been talking about serving the community, being part of the community. So July 15th, people, July 15th is an amazing day. We're going to be having a big community event. It's on a Saturday. We're going to be try to start it around 11. I know we're supposed to have a service and all of that, but we want to just dedicate that day for the community. So I want you to come dressed down, ready to help, ready to volunteer. We're going to have a health fair. We're going to be uh, giving children their shots to go back to school. We're going to be giving them backpacks with equipment in, in it. We want to be able to help our community. We're bringing in doctors from the community, restaurants, different people who are going to come in here to donate things and be able to help the community. So we're going to be we're going to be needing help and and set, you know getting stuff out in the homes, going out door to door, passing it out. But I just want you guys to stick that in your head, stick it in your calendars, and get ready for July 15. is an amazing day. All right. Okay. Now here's the next announcement that I have for you. On the 16th of April, that's like, like in about two weeks, okay? Like in about two weeks, I'm having a men's prayer breakfast at my house. So all the men, all the men are invited. Please bring your cousin, bring your uncle, bring somebody else, bring your neighbor. It's a great men's breakfast that I'm having at my house on April 16 at 9 a.m. at 891 Chase Road, West Palm Beach, Florida, three blocks that way. All right? So I'll see you guys there. So please, July 15, 
Amazing day, community day. Do not miss that. Stick that in your head. That's going to be an amazing Sabbath here at our church. And I will see all the men at my house.